So, in the sense of people squabbling about, uh, I have the right Reiki, or I have the only Reiki, or I, I have Reiki uh, from, uh, you know, Krishna or whatever, you know, all of this is working out the individual's process, and also it adds to this restraining and activating force on this global level, what we call the, what I call the global Reiki community. And Reiki is our, re, our reconciling force. And I believe that when we are really ready to surrender to that reconciling force and are able to hold the creative dissonance that is happening right now, we're going to get something really great. My name is René Vögtli. I'm a Reiki professional. Reiki is a healing and spiritual practice which was established early in the 20th century by Mikao Usui. His main successor, Dr. Jujiro Hayashi, died prior to Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. His successor was the 30-year-old Hawaii Takata, who takes Reiki from Japan to America. Today, Reiki can be found everywhere, in families, hospitals, even in prisons. When Takata died in 1980 without declaring her successor, she left behind 22 Reiki masters, baffled and without orientation. One of them was her granddaughter, Phyllis Furumoto, whom many recognized as her successor, and many did not. In the next decades, the Reiki community went through many tumultuous controversies which divided the community into several factions. There was hardly any openness for communication among them when I came to Reiki in 1991. With time, it became apparent that the protagonists need to disperse dissonances, let go of burdens from the past, allowing coexistence which honors, even celebrates, our diversity. In 2014, Pro Reiki, a German professional association for all Reiki styles, awarded Phyllis Furumoto an honorary membership. Her acceptance speech conveyed a sense of openness for conciliation. The time was right to reconcile. Reconciliation, this film, is a contribution to future Reiki generations on their path to mastery. Sponsors from all walks of Reiki life, from various Reiki styles, financed this film. I met with Phyllis for the first time in Berlin in the fall of 2015. I had a speech impediment from when I was very small, obviously when I started talking. And um, my first... Uh, like seven or eight years of schooling, I went to a speech therapist. And eventually, um, I asked my mother, why did you do this? Like, why were you so um, set on my being able to speak clearly? And she said, because you are going to grow up and speak to a lot of people. And I went, well, she is crazy. And then... Um, in school, because this was right after the war, people were not happy with having a Japanese child in school, and the teachers were extremely weird. Um, mostly the prejudice and the um, kind of hateful experiences I had in school were from teachers. I was not pretty. I certainly didn't match the... Um, the standards of beauty that all the other girls in my class did. Blonde, 
you know, straight legs, um, so on and so on. It's like, so that's how I went out in the world with, with this idea that I was not, I was not worthy to be a friend of anybody. I, um, I saw myself as very ugly, as having um, very little to offer people, and that I had friends was kind of a miracle. I didn't really understand why I had friends. When I was 25 or so, I was taken up to the mountains of Colorado uh, by some friends of mine who wanted to go skiing. So I started downhill skiing and it freed me. It freed my body so I could actually move effortlessly. Um, and that freed my spirit somehow. It was really an amazing transformation. As I was enjoying my skiing and uh, my wonderful life as a ski bum, um, I turned 30. And when I was um, having my birthday party, I realized that I needed to find something to do with my life, a vocation. And I went through all the jobs that I could think of and nothing actually fit. So little did I know that my mother calling me um, later on that fall and asking me to travel with my grandmother the next summer, the summer of 1979, uh, did I know that that would be the answer to my question? you know, about my own vocation and what I would do with for the rest of my life. And then I went off in the summer to um, travel with my grandmother, at a person that I didn't really like and I was really uncomfortable with, had a very painful relationship with. And at the same time, I feel that somehow Underneath it, Reiki was calling me, but I could only say that 20 years later. I, I couldn't have said that at the time. And um, I really did think I was going with her to carry her suitcases, make sure she didn't get robbed, and uh, make sure she ate well. So much to my surprise, it ended up to be the initiation as a master and my first um, teaching on how to teach classes and so on, and my first understanding about what Reiki was for her. So I felt betrayed by my mother, um, who encouraged me to go on this trip, never saying, well, you know, if you go, you're going to, you know, be working with your grandmother and so on. And then, um, when my grandmother initiated me, she says, and now you can work with me. I, I never uh, imagined teaching Reiki because up to that time, I didn't even know what Reiki was. And I really wanted to be able to assist people in realizing their individual authenticity. And little did I know that Reiki would be that gift, but... Um, I certainly didn't know it at the time I took the trip. I really lived with my grandmother. I found out what Reiki was in daily life. My practice of Reiki had brought me back into myself and given me the gift of knowing my strengths, my character, um, understanding beauty, and understanding that... Um, we make our own world, really, and my world was pretty tortured and um, really painful. And I have come out the other side. I don't feel like I'm really much different, but my um, viewpoint on the world is that it's a friendly place, which is very different than when I started out. Reiki has given me the possibility to rewrite my life, to have it be more accurate, to have it make more sense, and to understand the 
degree of distortion uh, that I lived in for a long time. And um, and then uh, my grandmother died. She had told me that she would live until Christmas, that she would for sure be there at Christmas. And um, she died on December 11th, and I was really angry for a month or something uh, because I felt that she had not kept her promise and that I would have done something really different if I had known that. But whenever I thought that, I would always hear her words saying, Reiki comes first. And then I would get even more angry because for me, family duty was really the most important thing in my life at that point. After Hawaii Takata died in December of 1980, the master community was slowly informed about this, about her death by my mother. And what I mean by slowly is that at first, um, she didn't call anyone, I don't know for how many months. And then she um, was starting to go through my grandmother's papers and compiled the list of people because some of the masters who my grandmother had initiated, she was not acquainted with and, and didn't know. As the masters began to be informed, many of them called me and recognized me over the phone in the sense that they said, well, your, your grandmother's successor, now what are you going to do? And it was a question that I couldn't really answer. <laughs> I remember the daughter of Virginia Samdahl said, I can acknowledge you as your grandmother's successor, but I also acknowledge Barbara Weber as my Reiki master. So in some way, she was the first one that articulated this difference between what I would call the initiation lineage and the spiritual lineage, although that wasn't actually named as such at that point. This phrase, the spiritual lineage, came in the second meeting at Barbara Brown's house when we were trying to put together statements of identity for this Reiki Alliance. And I still believe that these statements have great foresight and also a great challenge. One of them uh, says something like, um, we, we recognize all masters as equal in the oneness of Reiki. It doesn't mean we're the same. And it's very important for me, it was very important for me that this um, thought was a founding stone, a cornerstone of the Reiki Alliance. Because I didn't want anyone to feel that this Reiki Alliance was a, like an exclusive club. I would say that, that maybe... Um, 85% of the masters who were initiated by Hawaii Takata was a member of the Reiki Alliance at some point. And at that point, because we all practiced the same system, it was really easy to say that, that all masters are equal in the oneness of Reiki. I believe that if we are truly masters, we'll be able to understand that particular statement and actually support it because I believe that it's true. It's a piece of wisdom that we came up with that was way beyond actually our, our mental consciousness at the time. My membership of this circle of 22 masters initiated by and recognized by Hawaii Takata was very important to me. I felt that this circle held the energy of Reiki and the practice of Asui Shiki Ryoho um, up until now. So now it's Rick Bachner, Paul Mitchell, and myself. We were the youngest when um, 
she initiated us all. And I felt that as the Grand Master, as the recognized lineage bearer, that I was the spokesman for this circle. Now, what does Grand Master really mean? Well, you know, I still to this day don't really know. One of the things that is not understood at all, it seems, by the general public and by the Reiki community is that a Grand Master is actually recognized. It is not um, taken. So in the process of my becoming recognized as a Grand Master, I could not say to people, oh, I'm it, vote for me. Um, it needed to be come from the other side. It needed to be recognized. In truth, I couldn't do anything to change the system or to alter the message without actually um, going back to the circle and somehow having agreement among us. It was important for me to be able to hold the totality of what Hawaii Takata passed on as a practice and know that the totality really was about um, the 22 masters and in all the different ways and variations that we practiced that the truth of the practice was in the whole not was not in this person's practice or that person's practice but in the whole group voice of the practice what I'm working on is creating consciousness about something called the master body, which for me is this collective of all Reiki masters. And that whether or not you choose to be an active member of this body, you add to the body energetically just by being a master. And, uh, you know, at first, with all these different forms, I used to think that it was a betrayal of my grandmother and her teaching, you know, to stray from this form. But now what I'm seeing is that we created our whole field of different forms of Reiki practice so that people could enter however they came to Reiki and that people could find their way through Reiki. When we adapt a practice like Reiki that touches us, in this kind of essence place of our humanness, then we want to protect it, to control it in the sense of, you know, making sure it's not harmed, to be sure that other people don't harm it themselves. Um, we don't want it taken away from us. However, people assume that there was a way to control the proliferation of the different forms of practice. And I believe that there was absolutely no way to control that. I mean, this started happening from the moment Hawaii Takata died, or before. And I liken it to our human need to make things our own. And this is the part about mastery that is really important to understand. There's only one person who can change or corrode your practice, and that's you. And, um, and I feel that um, it's really easy to blame somebody else for your own frustration. But this is how, and this is how I've worked this whole thing out, is that I just thought, well, I can't be angry at these people because I see that they're just doing something very human. And so I let it go after a while. To understand the community's concerns and to listen to opposing voices, I spoke to 100 people. Amongst them, Frank Archava Petter, William Rand, and people around Barbara McGregor, 
and Barbara Weber Ray. Some still carry pain even 20, 30 years later. Some were critical of their own behavior in the past. They all agree on the importance of cultivating and honoring diversity. Five months after Berlin, I carried these voices to Arizona. Controversial questions about succession, the simple need for harmony, and the sober call for facts. The Reiki story, as it's told by Hawaii Takata, in truth, you know, like in factual truth, I have no idea, you know, how factual it is. I believe that there is truth in that story, a kind of bigger truth that no fact can destroy. And that um, this concentration on fact has been um, a little misused, not, I don't think, not consciously, but through the motivation of saving people from the untruth, whatever that is. So if we could generalize uh, and say that uh, this informational truth was sort of masculine and the feminine truth was, <coughs> excuse me, from my from feeling, then there would be a wish for me to bring these two together. And it's kind of on my bucket list of things to do uh, before I die that somehow these two will come together peacefully, not in competition, but in understanding that they actually uh, complement one another. I feel like I have to stay alive long enough for this to happen. Because uh, one cannot push these things, these kinds of coming together. So I believe that this filming, I believe your conversations with all these Reiki masters around the world, I believe that movements like the Australian Congress will bring these thing, factions together in a way that is the right time. And then when we meet, it will be able to be done in a way that people will say, well, that wasn't so difficult. Why did we think this was impossible? Certain people bring out certain qualities in us, you know, when we partner with them. And it's really interesting, you know, we always polarize. So, you know, the more macho the researchers are, you know, and now I feel like Frank Pater and William Rand and uh, some of the others have softened a bit. I don't know if that's really true or not, but it feels like they have. So I feel less defense, defended. And so, you know, it's like this is part of the process that's going to, it's going to take to have us come together, not particularly in the sense of being in the same room talking together, but being able to use their data and find it okay, and then, you know what I mean? If, if uh, individually we all worked on ourselves enough and were engaged enough to feel like we were able to go and meet each other, um, then the next line is what would, we, what would bring us together? And it would have to be a third line of work. It would have to be something that all of us were passionate about. And all of us were willing to come together to talk about this. Not here and not our individual selves. Reconciliation is, not, is the force that brings us together, but it's not the, it's not the purpose. Mm -hmm. So just to be clear, I couldn't, I mean, I could do reconciliation without meeting them. Um, when my grandmother died in 1980, uh, and Barbara Weber Ray, well, then Barbara Weber, um, said that she had been told that she would be the successor, I, my reaction was it was totally possible. And 
the um, process of succession is more than telling someone that you will be the successor. There has to be recognition. And of the 22 masters that were initiated by Hawaii Takata, most of them uh, recognized me. But because um, there was another factor, which is that the energy came to me. And this Hawaii Takata had no control over. I believe that this was also true about Chijiro Hayashi. He might not have wanted Takata, Hawaii Takata, to have been the successor, but he got where the energy was going and he surrendered to it. It wasn't that I was the favorite of my grandmother, let me tell you. She wanted me to be very different and she was not happy with me. But she also recognized something inside of me that I didn't even recognize myself in truth. And then I was recognized as the lineage bearer or grandmaster of the system, her successor. I tried to listen to all the voices and somehow come to a compromise about what I should do and, uh, and what should happen and what direction would we take and so on. But I started to find my own will and that was very important for me. One of the very first times that I had a difference of opinion with this group of masters was uh, in 1983 when we were drawing up the um, foundation of the Reiki Alliance. I wanted to found an organization that would lift everybody up to a higher purpose so that we could all sit in the same circle. So I kept inviting Barbara Weber Ray and her the masters that were her students or were her masters actually, to please come to the Reiki Alliance so that we could have a place to sit and talk. Barbara took the stance of being the only one who had better training than us, uh, that had received uh, uh, more symbols and, and so on, and um, eventually said that she was the only Reiki master that my grandmother, Hawaii Otakata, had ever actually initiated, that all the rest of us we're not really Reiki masters. So that put me and all of us into this question, are we really Reiki masters? And that was the best thing that could have happened to all of us, including me. Because I had to go inside myself and find this truth. You know, am I a Reiki master or not? Do I feel like I've gotten what I need from my master? And eventually the answer was yes. So she pushed me in a lot of ways, some not so nice. But I have to say, and I said this at the time in the 1980s, she was the gift that my grandmother left me. She made me, forced me, to go inside and find the strength that I needed to have this position and to be able to nourish and have the community nourish this part of me because I believe that all of us initiated by Hawaii Takata had the possibility of being her successor. I mean, I don't feel like I was special in the sense of I had more education or I had the right education or I had her bloodline or anything, that, that actually I don't think had any bearing on the case at all. The succession question for me has been one that has been foremost in my mind since 1983. And um, of course back then I was so young that I was going to live forever and we didn't really have to think about it. But I did think about it because my grandmother's death created so much havoc 
for all of us. And at that time, of course, we were still in this conversation with Barbara Weber, and I thought my grandmother could have been more clear and so on. And at the same time, realizing how advantageous it was to have a restraining force. We are working on uh, investigating what are the functions of the spiritual lineage. Is there an energetic essence called the master body, which I have spoken about from 1985 or 6. I believe there is a master body. There is an energetic body that includes all Reiki masters and especially all masters in the system and that they carry responsibility for the system because they're masters. And we investigate what is the process of succession? What actually happens energetically? You know, where will this succession go? And what I've realized personally for myself is that, of course, somebody is not going to apprentice with me and be the next me. Somebody is going to appear at the time that's very close to my death, and they're going to be recognized as the lineage bearer. And this person will take Reiki a whole nother step that I cannot even imagine. This succession um, may or may not be one person. I don't know. It could end up being um, a group of people. But for sure, the master body of this system needs to be able to open to another way of thinking and another way of being as masters. I would say a higher expression of mastery in order for this succession process to be successful. And what I mean by successful is that it is done not without conflict because I don't believe that there's a possibility of no conflict. But I believe that we can see the conflict as a natural progression toward a creative resolution, reconciliation. If they don't keep that in mind, if they vote, if they want to take a vote by personality, then I will have failed. A few years ago, I was introduced to this little book uh, called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. It's a really great way to um, measure and to take assessment of our own humanness in human relationships and in the relationships with the planet and everything else as well. And I, I, these four little phrases run through my mind. Uh, always do your best. Don't take it personally. Do not make assumptions, and be impeccable with your word. I try to do that in my own life. And of course, being a human being, when I do my best, I often don't do what other people want uh, or expect. When uh, I don't take it personally, sometimes people think that I'm cold or I don't care. Uh, when I don't make assumptions, it means that I don't assume that somebody is hurt. I don't assume that um, this is being taken the wrong way, or I don't assume that it actually affects people, uh, which is actually not usually accurate. <laughs> I feel as Reiki masters, all of us do our best in every given moment. Oftentimes, it's easy for outsiders to say, well, why didn't, they, why didn't she do this? Or why didn't she do that? But it's easy when you're outside of the situation to see other options. Uh, personally, I believe that you and all Reiki masters, and myself included, always do our best in any given moment. The one about don't take things personally, that's tough. Because in the beginning, uh, especially in the early 1990s, I thought that the changes 
that were happening in, in different practices and the formation of new forms of Reiki were an affront to Hawaii Otakata. And of course, I wanted to defend her. And so I definitely took things personally, if not personally also for Hawaii Otakata. So I was a bit strict and a bit strong in those days and really confused because at the same time, I really do um, believe that every person has a right to their own opinion and who they are. So even though uh, my students differ in opinion and in uh, theory from me, I want to also say that I would defend their right to have their space, have their opinion, and have their theory. When we make assumptions, oftentimes what we're doing is filling in the gap of the unknown. And I believe that as Reiki masters, and I've wanted to train myself to do this, that if there is something that I don't know, I try not to make an assumption in order to fill in the unknown, but to just allow it to be and to see what happens. Well, of course, in the early days, I wasn't very good at this, and I made lots of assumptions. And now I trust that uh, the number of assumptions that I'm making to fill in the blanks um, have lessened. And in making those assumptions, I feel like I have um, put other people in boxes or put uh, onto people certain attitudes that maybe weren't correct. Be impeccable with your word. This one is really important for me. Um, I really try to be impeccable, which means to say my truth as best I can in any given moment. And the most important part of this is the in any given moment. Because the minute that I have a conversation with somebody, that idea or that word could change. So in keeping to this um, feeling of doing my best at the time, I think that when I was in the mid-1990s, when I was going through this trademark thing, uh, I had some regrets, but I couldn't have made a different decision at the time in 1983. I just couldn't have. It was not to be done. Um, another decision that I made um, that people, uh, that has, has seemed to be a very big deal in the Reiki community um, was in... Uh, uh, 1988, when, during the first um, Reiki Alliance conference in Europe, uh, in Friedrichsdorf, I made a very important speech. And unfortunately, I wasn't, I wasn't able to be articulate and to uh, be accurate in my word. So... Um, people, misunder people misunderstood me. They um, interpreted the speech really differently and, um, than I had imagined they would. So basically, this, the whole thing that it came to was that I um, that I had listened with growing dismay about people saying, well, you're the only one who has the power to initiate masters. They wanted to have kind of a physical, you can initiate masters and you cannot. You know, you are not ready and you are. And I, I couldn't have done that because it really, really, um, for me, was not my place to bless anybody to initiate masters nor to prevent them from initiating masters. Uh, I made this speech and I, I said, you know, it is 
a master's right to share their information and their uh, calling as a master to any student that they feel is worthy. And it is up to you to prepare yourself for this step. And I don't know if any of the other messages got through, but uh, the response was, I had given away my power. Uh, I had, and I said, I haven't given away anything. I had nothing to give away because this whole power thing was a misconception. You know, it's not about giving away your power. It's about sharing sacred tools so that uh, a worthy student can step on the path of mastery and have their own experience of this. I spent a lot of guilty feelings around this because it was so misunderstood at the time. I felt like I hadn't been able to really articulate what I wanted to. And, you know, at some point, I just had to say I did my best and it opened up the space and it was a little ungraceful, but in the end, it accomplished what I wanted and that was to dispel this idea that it was only me who had the power to initiate masters. That was really important for me. Could I have done something different? No, I felt like I did my best. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, my best was not nearly good enough. So can I forgive myself? Well, yes, I feel like I have because I couldn't go on if I hadn't. If I knew then what I know now, it would have been a very different scene. And I didn't. So, speaking about it helps because I feel that I'm able to uh, speak about it in a way that I don't bring up my guilt and I don't bring up um, feeling small and inadequate, but I just bring up this uh, overwhelming feeling of sadness that um, it couldn't have been different, if that makes any sense. That I would have liked for it to have been different for everyone. Uh, and it wasn't. So there's that part of me being human. And then there's the other part of me which just is uh, shy and sometimes um, not wanting to put myself on the firing line. Uh, I have more courage these days, and I also have more understanding about where other people come from, that I feel like everyone is doing their best. Uh, everyone follows their path of Reiki. And even though I may not like it or I don't agree with it, I will fight to the death for your right to have your own path. Because for me, that is the gift of Reiki and the gift of this path. I also feel that um, whether or not I like it, I've made assumptions. And whether or not I like it, I've not always um, said what I really needed to because of my shyness or because I feel like... Um, I won't be taken seriously. So there are many different relationships that I have that I don't even know I have uh, out in the Reiki world and also relationships where I know that I've transgressed. Um, and for all these times when uh, you feel that I've transgressed, that I've entered your space uh, unwillingly and uninvited, where I've offended you in some way, where uh, my um, where my loyalty to my master 
has caused you pain because it's different from what you have learned is Reiki and that has given you pain. For all these things, I want to ask your forgiveness because it wasn't my intention. It's not the way I hold you. And um, everyone has been a great teacher for me. And without you, I wouldn't be who I am today. It is my hope that my legacy will be that I not only invited the Reiki community to move to a higher expression, but to have guided it so that it became a higher expression of itself. What we're moving into as a community for me is a maturity, but it needs to what I feel like Reiki is asking of all of us is, is to do this reconciliation, not for reconciliation's sake, but as a stepping stone to the next stage of development of this practice, and I mean practice globally. And that is to be able to um, develop into a practice that serves humanity and serves life. That's very, very clear from the self-treatment of those individuals to associations and groups of people who do specific projects to the global community that actually votes and informs the government leaders uh, of our times and that actually make a difference on a political and on a spiritual and on a mental level. And the only way we can do that is to act together. With all this momentum and moving into the future, it is clear to me that Reiki is saying, okay, now you're ready for the big picture. You know, the world is not about mommy and daddy, my Reiki master, my lineage. It's about our Reiki. And it's about our gift to humanity. And once we have this overarching understanding of what we have to offer the world, then we can develop our individual selves and our local communities to meet and to serve in that way. Um, I'd like to be known as the person who saw that and fanned the flames. Thank you.